Hey, Kevin here, Skylabs, bringing you another video. Definitely gonna be a fun one. Today we're gonna go over the best vintage receivers you can buy in spring 2023 for 600 bucks. You're not gonna wanna miss this one, stick around. And I've gotta start off with saying thank you to everybody that subscribed, everybody that's joined the membership program, and to all of you that have left comments in our videos. Leaving a simple comment, even just a thumbs up, or giving us your comments about the video really helps the YouTube algorithm to push our video out to people that might not know about us. So please leave comments in the description if you want to help support the channel, if you're getting something out of these videos, and we really greatly appreciate it. And a couple quick things about this list before we dive in. These are the receivers I would pick if I had a $600 budget and I was wanting to get a vintage receiver from the 70s. There are a lot of other really good picks out there. We just need to think about the length of the video going in. So if your receiver isn't on the list or your pick, put it down in the comments. We'd love to hear it. But these are definitely some of them I'd be looking for if I had a $600 budget and was wanting a vintage receiver. The second thing, I'm not gonna go into great detail about how these sound. Once again, these are all over 40 years old. They all kind of sound different depending on their use, depending on their level of service and whatnot. As a generality though, we have people come in and they say, I'm looking for a warm tube-like sound. And my recommendation usually is to look for the older solid state, early 70s stuff, as I do think the engineers were just getting done with the tube era and kind of had that sound in their heads. I think by the mid 70s to late 70s, they started to get more clinical, more of a sterile sound. Not that the later ones are cold sounding, but I do think the earlier 70s stuff does have kind of a warmer tube-like sound to it. Once again, just a generality, but maybe that helps you kind of figure out which direction you wanna go in order to get the sound you're looking for. And lastly, I'm going off eBay sold prices for these. You might be able to find these in your market or your local area cheaper or more expensive just depending on where you live everybody has access to ebay though and therefore i'm kind of using it as the standard to make the list i think most of these are readily available between four to seven hundred dollars i was trying to shoot for six but there's obviously going to be some variables there with all that out of the way let's get into the list and coming in at the number six spot, we've got the Marantz, the 2220B. The Marantz 2220B was sold between 1975 and 1977. It's 20 watts per channel. This is definitely a no frills, not a lot of extra features type of receiver. But if you are looking for that Marantz look and sound, this gets you there for $600. A lot of people don't need more than 20 watts per channel. I particularly would not need any more than that for most of the speakers I own. So don't let that 20 watts per channel fool you. If, if you got a $600 budget and you really want the Marantz look and sound, this might be the perfect place to go. These are kind of a, a stripped down, I almost look at them almost like an empty box type of receiver. However, there was a reason for that. They wanted this receiver to be compatible with their WC22 cabinet, the same cabinet that housed the larger receivers like the 2270s. So while it is kind of an empty box, when you do look on the inside of this, that also is a plus in that they're really easy to work on. They're really well laid out. They're just a really good quality receiver with not a lot of known issues. You get all the greatness of a nice Marantz piece in a more economical solution that I think would suit most people's needs. If you have to have a Marantz, look at the 2220B, and that's our number six pick. Now, for those of you out there that want some more bells and whistles, you'd like some extra features, you want a, a bigger receiver, more wattage, our number five spot is for you. That is the Kenwood KR7600. They were manufactured 1976, and it's rated at 70 watts. Some of those extra features with the KR7600 as opposed to some of the entry level units would be, is you get two phono inputs. You've got your pre-in main out, which is always a great feature to have just to open up your possibilities to EQs 
and powered subwoofers and stuff like that. You also get three sets of speaker jacks, so you could have three sets of speakers hooked up. You can only run two at a time. However, it keeps you from having to fiddle around with speaker wires if you've maybe got an additional set of speakers on your deck or den or what have you. There are definitely a lot of bells and whistles on this Kenwood, including the looks. There's a lot going on. They have a great look to them. I really like the chrome framing on the faceplate. They've got that nice back dial that takes LEDs really well, kind of cleans them up and takes the haze away. If you want a nice showpiece, something that draws attention, I don't think you can go wrong with getting 70 watts per channel, a lot of bells and whistles for 600 bucks. In my opinion, this is Kenwood's kind of heyday of receivers. Um, the only drawback to this one, in my opinion, would be that plastic back panel. Not a deal breaker by any stretch of the imagination, but it's definitely worth noting that um, it doesn't have a, a steel back panel. It's plastic. So if that bugs you, maybe think about that. If not, I'd be happy to have this as a, as a daily driver for 600 bucks any day of the week. So that is our number five spot. That is the Kenwood KR9600. And coming in at number four, we've got the Sansui G5000. At 45 watts per channel, these were manufactured between 1978 and 1980. This is one of the first vintage receivers I ever owned. It was plenty of power for me to power any of the speakers I had. Once again, it's kind of a stripped down unit. There's not a lot of bells and whistles. You don't have extra phono inputs or speaker jacks or anything like that. If you're wanting to get into that Sansui G series, which is becoming so popular, the G5000 might be the perfect place to look. At 600 bucks, you're getting a really serviceable, really well-made vintage receiver with a great look and great sound. I don't think you can go wrong with the G series. It is probably my preferred series of Sansui, at least with their receivers. I do think they're a little bit more on the clinical side of sounding as opposed to the more tube-like sound of like the 9090 and the, the 2000A or X series. So if you're looking for tube sound, you might want to go a little bit older. But if you like that more punchy, clinical, solid state sound from the later 70s, I think this is a great choice. At 600 bucks, I don't think you can go wrong, and I don't think these are going to go down in value. So that's our number four spot. That's the Sansui G5000. And coming in at number three, we've got the Yamaha CR800. And these were made in 1974. Again, we've got 40 watts per channel, which is really close to that sweet spot, in my opinion, of 50 watts, where you can almost drive any speakers, especially the vintage area, with no problems at all. Yamaha is very unique, in my opinion, of this era. And their design choices, the sleekness, the simplicity, and they were the first ones to really push the natural clinical sound, in my opinion. I love the sound of the Yamahas. I like the looks of them. Some people don't. Some people also do not like the variable loudness control. Yamaha was unique in this in that most manufacturers made an on-off switch for the loudness. Yamaha decided to make it variable so you could adjust the amount of loudness. When you crank up the loudness on a Yamaha, it drops the volume. And I think that bugs some people, almost kind of like the the spinal tap, this one goes to 11. I think it's kind of a mental thing. I don't know if people think they're pushing their amp too hard when they run it at 12 o'clock. The, the Sansui behind me, the AU20000, has a logarithmic volume control. A lot of times, even at moderate levels, I find I'm over 12 o'clock with that particular amplifier. I know it's got plenty of gas in it. It doesn't bug me, but I know it bugs some people. So if you like getting loud volumes in the beginning portions of a volume control and you like loudness, maybe stay away from the Yamaha. Other than that, they are incredible sounding. They're incredibly well built. And I don't see why anybody wouldn't be happy with a Yamaha unless they didn't like the aesthetics of it or they were looking for that warm tube sound. So I also need to mention this Yamaha CR800 does have the pre-out main ends 
which once again, even if you're not planning on using them now, you never know when you're going to want to add something in. And this really does open up a lot of possibilities. So definitely need to note that. And that is our number three spot, the Yamaha CR800. And our number two pick, we've got the Pioneer SX939. The Pioneer SX939 was manufactured between 1974 and 1976. We've got 70 watts per channel and a lot of features with this receiver. Uh, you get two phonos, you've got your pre-in, main out, and you've also got three sets of speakers. So a lot of options. This is a big receiver, bang for the buck. I don't think it gets much better than this. I do think these are a little bit on the warm side and maybe not as clinical as where they went with the 80 series and stuff like that. In my opinion, Pioneer really nailed everything about this series. I think this is right in the middle of Pioneer's heyday. I think the X2X, X3X, 50 and 80 series are the best Pioneer made. And this is right in the middle. This is a big receiver. It's a second from the flagship. I think it'd be a lot more expensive if it was the flagship. So you're getting one step down from the flagship. If you don't need that extra power, you've got a $600 price point. I don't think you can go wrong with this receiver. The only thing, there's one caveat with the SX939 or any Pioneer in the X3X series, and that is they are plagued with black-legged transistors. You want to make sure if you're purchasing one of these that those transistors have either been changed out or you have a tech that is capable of changing them out. We've seen so many of these with that problem that we just replace them when they come in the door. We don't even bother testing them because we don't want them coming back. So that's the only negative to the Pioneer X3X line would be the black-legged transistors. Shouldn't be an expensive repair. Get that taken care of and you've got a great receiver that's gonna last a long time. That is our number two spot. That is the Pioneer SX939 and an incredible receiver. And coming in at the number one spot for the best receiver we think you can get for $600, in my opinion, it's the Harman Kardon 730 Twin. These were manufactured in 1976. They've got 40 watts per channel, which in my opinion is just enough power to be able to power just about any pair of vintage speakers you could find. The 730 Twin has something very unique to it that it's dual mono. None of these other amplifiers are dual mono. That is a feature that I don't know of any other manufacturer doing in this era at this price point. There's a lot of really good information out there on the difference between dual mono and stereo amplification. Paul McGowan from PS Audio covers it in several videos. If you're wanting to learn more about that topology, I would recommend going and watching his videos as he's already covered it so well. I do think Harmon and Cardin really hit it out of the park with this whole line. The fact that they could get you a dual mono amplifier at that price point is pretty astonishing. And it really just tells you the level at which they were shooting for. Putting a dual mono amplifier into this receiver was not cost effective. It's definitely an expensive feature because you have two power supplies. And that really makes it unique. Again, at the $600 price point for a vintage receiver of this caliber, dual mono. Personally, I really love the modern look of these. I think they did a great job with designing them. They're very easy to work on. They're very well laid out. There's so many positives for the Harman Kardon 730 Twin that at $600, I think it's a steal personally. So if you can get your hands on one of these, grab it. You're not going to lose money if it's not the right fit for you. And as far as the sound goes, I do think it's kind of in the middle there. You know, it's not overly warm, but it's not overly clinical either. It's kind of right in the middle. It's the best of both worlds. And that's why the Harman Kardon 730 Twin is at number one. And thanks for making it to the end of another video. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited to see the comments on this one. I know everybody's gonna have a different opinion on what ones should be there, maybe what ones shouldn't be there. If you've owned one of these, if you've had different experiences with them, leave those down there below. I'm just really excited to hear your thoughts and how you would have made this list different. So I'll look forward to the comments. I really appreciate it. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you.